everybody. Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show here on Reason and Theology. I want to go over papal authority according to the church fathers. This is not going to be an exhaustive analysis, of course. In fact, it's quite impossible to do so in one show. There's just such a plethora of uh, patristic uh, attestation to papal authority. So what I want to do is go over some highlights beginning with the 4th century uh, through the 8th century, just some highlights, again, not even exhaustive for this time period, um, from the work of Doranzo on the science of sacred theology. And here he has, in his fourth volume on the church, he has a whole bunch of church fathers that he goes over. And I'm going to kind of skip through some of this stuff and start around the fourth century and kind of go over, you know, a summary of um, patristic testimony that he offers that I think uh, might be helpful. So let's take a look at it. Let's uh, let's go over here to the, um, again, 4th century to the end of the patristic age. Um, as persecutions expired and freedom of action was given to the church, the Roman primacy received a fuller ex expression and manifested its influence more effectively. Now, he, he, again, has gone through a lot of other material showing the papacy prior to this time period. So he's by no means denying that it's there in previous centuries. This is shown in the patristic literature, in the declarations of the Roman pontiffs, and in the acts of the ecumenical councils. The Father's Doctrine can be summarized under the following headings. The series of Roman pontiffs, that is, popes, starts with Peter, Optatus of Malevis. In the city of Rome, the Episcopal chair was given to Peter. And this unique chair, which is the first of the divine endowments, first set Peter, to whom Linus succeeded. And then the list of the Roman pontiffs continues. And that's from his work on the schism of the Donatus. Likewise, Augustine draws the list of the Roman pontiffs starting from Peter's see, from Peter himself. And that's, again, in his work on against the epistle of Manichaeus. So there's plenty of not just these two uh, references, but plenty of other attestations in the church fathers to um, Peter beginning the papacy. The Roman see is Peter's see, or Peter's chair. See Augustine just quoted. Also Peter, Peter Chrysologus. Pay heed obsessively, I'm sorry, pay heed obediently to the things that have been written by the most blessed Pope of the Roman city. For the blessed Peter who lives and presides in his own see bestows faith to those who seek the truth. Then he gives a quote from Jerome. I keep the unity in communion with your beatitude, that is, with Peter's chair. I know that the church has been built upon that rock. He says that in his epistle to Pope Damasus. The Roman see is the apostolic chair or the apostolic see. For instance, Augustine says the sovereignty of the apostolic chair was always in the Roman church. It continues, the Roman church presides as a sovereign over all the other churches. And here Gregory of Nazianzus, an Eastern father, says, it presides over all. And Theodoret of Cyrus says, that most holy see holds in many ways the sovereignty over the churches of the entire world, especially because it kept immune of heretical corruption and never a dissenter sat in it. But everyone kept the integrity of the apostolic gift. The Roman See is the source of all rites in the church. Ambrose says, From that see derive into all the rites of the venerable communion. And then that famous phrase, Rome has spoken, the case is closed. This famous axiom derives from Augustine saying about the debate on the Pelagian heresy, quote, Concerning this question, two conciliar decisions have been sent to the Apostolic See, 
Also, rescripts came from there. Hence, the trial was over. So it's kind of a simplistic way of uh, paraphrasing what Augustine was getting at here. The Roman pontiffs themselves constantly asserted their primacy, as is shown in the following summary of their doctrine. They applied to themselves Christ's words to Peter, Matthew 16, 18, Thou art Peter, and John 21, 15 through 17, Feed my lambs. Thus Sericius, Boniface I, and the decree of Galatius, Hormizdas, Pelagius, Nicholas I, and so on. And it gives you some references from Denzinger if you want to take a look at them uh, for specific references and quotes. It continues, the Roman pontiff received the primacy from Christ himself. The decree of Galatius by a private, private author about the beginning of the 6th century. The Roman church received the primacy through the evangelical voice of the Lord and Savior. And then Pope Nicholas I. The privileges of the Roman church are established in the blessed Peter by the mouth of Christ. And, and by the way, again, many others can be referenced here. He, he's just given you a few. I mean, I think of Pope Damasus earlier than both of these guys who uh, indicates the same thing. There's plenty of others. The Roman pontiff is Peter's Peter's moral person, Sericius says. The Roman pontiff is the apostolic rock. Innocent I says, whenever a question of faith is dealt with, all must refer only to Peter, that is, to the one who bears his name and his honor. Pope Leo I says, the blessed Peter did not leave the government which he received in his see, that is, the Roman. His power is alive and his authority is invisible. And I can also think of the Council of Ephesus, the Third Ecumenical Council, that says the exact same thing about Pope Celestine at the time. Peter remains in his successors. See Pope Leo I, just quoted. Philip, the apostolic legate at the Council of Ephesus, Peter is always living in his successors. Again, that's the Third Ecumenical Council, received by both Catholics and Orthodox. The Roman pontiff is Peter's heir. And has Peter's see. Leo I and Galatius quoted above. The Pope has the care of all the churches. See Innocent I and Denzinger 2.18. Leo I in his sermon 5.2. He is the head of all the churches. Pope Boniface I, Denzinger 2.33, Decree of Galatius, Hadrian I. And that's also at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. I believe that references to the Seventh Ecumenical Council. It calls them the head of all the churches. Multiple ecumenical councils in the first millennium called the Pope the head of all the churches. The Roman pontiff decides and judges on all ecclesial, ecclesiastical matters and is judged by no one. Pope Boniface I attests, It is certain that the last settlement of things depends on his decision, which is irreformable. Denzinger 234. And Galatius I, the see of the blessed Peter, has the right of judging over all the churches, and no one can judge its decision. The canons allow to appeal to it from all parts of the world, but no one can appeal from it to any other authority. Nicholas I, the first see is judged by no one. Very, very few famous phrase that you'll see over and over and over in the first millennium denzinger 638 against photius who did come back into communion and died in communion by the way the eighth ecumenical councils from the the eight ecumenical councils from the nicene first so nicene one and 325 to constantinople six in 870 i think they meant four i think that's a typo in 870 yeah that's that's a typo which were all celebrated in the East before the schism took place, offer an outstanding practical testimony to the Roman primacy inasmuch as they were assembled and held by, I'm sorry, with the explicit compliance of the Roman See and in the presence of its legates, with the exception of Constantinople 1 and 2, and submitted their acts and final decisions to the approbation of the Roman See. Moreover, in some of them, explicit declarations of the Roman primacy were uttered. Correct. I mean, think of Ephesus, think of Chalcedon, uh, think of uh, Constantinople III, and then Nicaea II. 
The Council of Constantinople 1 in 381 voted a canon giving the bishop of that city a primacy of honor after the Roman bishop because the city itself is a younger Rome, canon 3. This shows at least a general acknowledgement of the Roman primacy. At any rate, such a canon was never approved by Rome as being detrimental to the bishops of Alexandria and Antioch, who were already given a similar honor by the preceding Council of Nicaea 1 to 325. It was later on accepted as far as uh, Constantinople being two in the taxes. That was later on, much later, uh, except that I think by the time of the Eighth, Ec Eighth Ecumenical Council, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so eventually Rome did accept that, but I would point out there was all there was Damasus who was saying it's not by canons that Rome has its primacy. So it might be by canons that Constantinople is number two in the taxes, but it is not by canons that Rome is number one. It is by a divine establishment and institution of our Lord, uh, according to Pope Damasus. In the Council of Ephesus in 431, the authoritative influence of Pope Celestine I is manifest. The council was presided over by Cyril of Alexandria through the Pope's explicit commission. The pontifical legates read to the council Celestine's epistle, which was received with acclamation, and after the deliberations, they subscribed and confirmed the acts. One of the legates, Philip by name, in his allocution, made an explicit and remarkable declaration of the Roman primacy, which is quoted by Vatican I in its constitution of the church. So, right. So, what you find with Vatican I isn't out of nowhere. It's actually quoting multiple ecumenical councils that even the orthodox accept likewise the council of chalcedon in 451 clearly testified to the roman primacy before the council both parties namely eutyches founder of monophysitism and the patriarch flavian who had been condemned or who had condemned his doctrine appealed to pope leo the first in the course of the council the papal legates declared that they brought to the council the orders of the pope of the city of rome after the public reading of Leo's dogmatic epistle to Flavian, the fathers uttered the acclamation, Peter has spoken through Leo. In their synodical epistle sent to the Pope, the fathers again acknowledged that Leo had spoken as interpreter of the voice of Blessed Peter. Having ended their dogmatic decisions, the fathers, in the absence of the papal legates, voted the famous canon 28, confirming the third canon of Constantinople, one that we just looked about, uh, looked at, about the primacy of honor for the patriarch of Constantinople. But the legates and the pope refused to approve it, and it was annulled by the authority of St. Peter. So here you have the pope annulling a canon of an ecumenical council. And how did the East respond to that? They acquiesced. It wasn't until later that Canon 28 ended up finding itself into uh, Eastern uh, co co the Eastern collections of the uh, Code of Canon Law. The Council of Constantinople II, held in 553 against the will of Pope Vigilius, became legitimate only when this pope brought by force to Constantinople ill-treated and excommunicated by the council, um, finally gave his approval to its decisions. You know, that's a whole another thing in and of itself, but I'll point out that Vigilius thought that he was supreme over an ecumenical council because he was issuing decrees over and against the ecumenical council. So he sure believed in papal supremacy. The Council of Constantinople III in 680 to 681 condemned monothelitism in the presence of papal legates. The epistle previously sent to the emperor by Agatho was acclaimed by the fathers. Let me scroll back where we were. Claimed by the fathers. Uh, let's see. Lost it here. Okay. With the words, through Agatho, Peter has spoken. It is true that the council solemnly condemned Honorius, Agatho's predecessor, but the object of the condemnation was the religious policy of Honorius rather than his doctrine, and only in this sense does this condemnation seem to have been approved by Leo II. Now, I have a ton of videos on the Honorius issue, so definitely see those, but actually the Sixth Ecumenical Council has way stronger statements than this. The Sixth Ecumenical Council accepted papal indefectibility in its teaching authority. Um, in its acceptance of Agatho's um, Agatho's uh, letter to the emperor, which was read out loud. And so then um, they also accepted that all the predecessors of Agatho were free from error, which would include Honoria. So again, see the videos that I have on uh, the case of the Sixth Ecumenical Council and Honorius for more details. Or my book, Answering Orthodoxy, I go over it there as well.
The Council of Nicaea II in 787 was likewise held in the presence of the papal legates, and its decisions were confirmed by Pope Adrian I. Well, there's also several instances of papal supremacy um, and, and authority over all the other churches at Nicaea II. So he's really selling the Sixth and Seventh Ecumenical Councils short. So he's underselling the papal claims, really, in the first millennium. By, by no means is he overselling. He's underselling them. In other words, there's a lot more here. The Council of Constantinople IV, held in 870 in the presence of the legates of Pope Adrian II, accepted the so-called formula of the faith of Hormizdus against Christological errors in which the Roman primacy is explicitly asserted. Right, so a lot more. Um, that's pretty much it for from the 4th to the 8th century on what he has presented. Again, as I said, this is by no means exhaustive. There is just so much more. And in fact, you could just go to any of my videos on papal primacy or the papacy, and you could get an idea for some other instances. But I thought this was kind of concise and uh, kind of a one-stop shop for some of the basics of things to consider from that time period. So I wanted to just briefly review it with y'all. All right. If y'all enjoyed this, hit that like button and the subscribe button and leave a comment there in the comment section. God bless. Hey friends, do you want others to discover why the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus established? And do you want to help people make sense of all the confusion in the Catholic Church today? Help contribute to this mission by supporting Reason and Theology at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. By doing so, you'll also get access to exclusive content for patrons only. Also, if you want to deepen your faith, there are free ebooks and even courses that you can sign up for by visiting reason.podia.com. Are you a Catholic thinking about converting to Eastern Orthodoxy? Or are you a Protestant discerning whether or not to become Catholic or Eastern Orthodox? If so, I have the book just for you. It's called Answering Orthodoxy and engages all of the arguments that Eastern Orthodox use against the Catholic Church. I respond to all of them. I show that they are in error and in fact they're inconsistent because the things that Orthodox are objecting to are in fact found in their own tradition. So the fullness of the faith can only be found in the Catholic Church. Check out the book right now at shop.catholic.com for your copy today.